Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. Today we continue with our analysis of the WMAP satellite. In our previous video, I presented the key instrumental features of this satellite. In addition to the anisotropy map, the results from the K, KA, Q, V, and W bands were introduced. Importantly, I also emphasize that in each of these bands, the galactic foreground constitutes an important contamination which simply cannot be removed without perfect knowledge or ability to control signal at the source. Furthermore, note that the galactic foreground is unstable from year to year. Once again, you can learn more in this paper about removing a powerful signal from a weak underlying signal. Despite all this, the WMAP team certainly believes that it can remove the foreground. Now let us see how they attempt the feat. The first step, of course, was to clean the image obtained from each channel, as can be seen again here. Remember that the WMAP team did not show results for the K and KA bands precisely because the pre-cleaned data for those bands would appear to be essentially completely red on this scale. Keep in mind that the galactic center of the foreground can exceed the brightness of the desired anisotropy signal by a factor of about a thousand, as you can learn in this paper. So now let's move to the key problem for the WMAP team, how to remove the galactic contribution. There are many approaches that could be used, including using masks and maximum entropy methods. But I want to focus on the internal linear combinations used in the three-year average data release as it is the easiest method to convey to everyone. The general lessons can be applied to any other methods. Namely, it is impossible to properly remove the galactic foreground as all methods are both arbitrary and unverifiable. Now, in the three-year average data release, the WMAP team first defines a self-imposed region containing galactic signals, as you can see here. Of course, in the K and KA bands, galactic signals are known to extend much beyond this region in the raw data. This is also true to a lesser extent for Q, V, and W bands. The WMAP team subdivides the galaxy into 11 regions. There is no basis for drawing straight lines through the galaxy, and that in itself should give anyone cause to ponder the method. They also define a region beyond the mask for the galaxy and label it as region zero on this plot. Next comes the interesting part. The WMAP team takes a linear combination of microwave frequencies measured in each region of the galaxy in order to get rid of the galactic foreground and preserve the underlying cosmic fluctuations. This table depicts the coefficients used in the three-year average data set as seen in this paper. It is important to examine the numbers which make up this table very carefully. The WMAP team uses coefficients in this table for each region separately. So let us go through a specific case. In order to remove the galactic contribution from region 3, they take minus 0 0.0807 times K band plus 0 0.0230 times Ka band minus 0 0.3483 times Q band plus 1.3943 times V band plus 0 0.0118 times W band. That will all sum to 1. But what does this all mean? In reality, probably nothing, except to null most of the signal in that region of the sky. The small residual remaining is thought to be the sought-after microwave background. Yet how much is caused by the galaxy and how much is behind it will never be known for sure. In fact, the WMAP team can never definitively claim that any of the residual near the galactic plane ever came from beyond the galaxy. But what is most amazing is the extent to which the coefficients vary from region to region. That in itself tells you that there are problems with this approach. Let us have a look at a couple of examples while focusing initially on regions 4, 5, and 6, which are located at the center of the galaxy. The coefficients for V-band tell the story. Notice how the values are changing. For region 4, we had 0 0.9667. For region 5, we get 2.4184. And finally, for region 6, 
we get 0 0.9821. The values vary by a factor of 2.5 without any scientific justification whatsoever. Again, each of these regions is separated by a straight line, which in itself was without basis. But if you look more closely, you will see even more in these numbers. For these same regions, simply examine K, Ka, and W bands. The signs of the coefficients are not even the same. That means that in one region, the signal for one channel was added, while in the very adjacent region, it was subtracted. In fact, one could play with numbers all day, as the only requirement is to get a normalized value of 1 for the sum coefficients. This is true for every region, and that includes region 0. That is why anyone can generate their own anisotropy map. One only has to take clean images, outline different regions, and start multiplying with coefficients that sum to 1. But the reality is far worse, as one can advance numerous unrelated approaches for generating anisotropy maps. Here is a list of papers outlining new and unique methods of generating anisotropy maps. Each paper claims to yield new advantages, but only one thing concerns us. All the results differ from one another. Let us examine just a couple of examples using difference methods in order to get the general idea. In the first year data release, for instance, the WMAP team itself provides anisotropy maps derived using both internal linear combination methods outlined above and the maximum entropy method as you can learn in this paper. The two images are presented here and it is clear that they do not agree in fine detail. Let us place the maps one on top of each other and rapidly vary the opacity of the overlying map. The flickering we observe serves to emphasize the difference in the maps. We can also subtract the map obtained using the maximum entropy method from the map obtained using the internal linear combination approach. That should give us a completely black image if the maps were identical, but clearly there is a great deal of remaining residual signal. Simply put, these maps are completely different from one another. Beyond the WMAP team, Professor Tegmark's laboratory advanced his own method of removing the foreground in this paper, resulting in this map. For, in order to further illustrate that the map from the Tegmark team differs from the anisotropy map presented by the WMAP team, let us once again place the maps one on top of each other and rapidly vary the opacity of the overlying map. I was only able to obtain the low resolution version of these images, but the point can still be made. When you overlap the maps, you can immediately recognize that they are not the same. In fact, they are vastly different. Again, this can be easily ascertained when the WMAP result is subtracted from the map provided by Professor Tegmark. This leads to an important conclusion. There is no such thing as a unique solution for the anisotropy maps. No single map has more of a claim on the correct solution versus another. As a result, an infinite number of maps actually exists. Beyond the inability to remove the foreground, that presents the next insurmountable challenge to the cosmologist. They cannot advance any map as definitive. Everything depends on data processing, and that renders cosmological conclusions from these maps completely arbitrary. Cosmology cannot claim to be a precise science when one does not even possess converging results. As such, any perceived claim of agreement between two anisotropy maps, whether from the same satellite or between satellite, has no merit whatsoever, precisely because no unique processing methods has more validity than another. To further emphasize the point that no unique map exists, let us focus on temporal variability issues by reviewing how the WMAP team treated region zero in year one versus the three year average. The coefficients for both are listed in this table. Let us examine these one column at a time, since region zero covers most of the celestial sky. Note that for K-band, the coefficients change by 43% from 0.109 in year one to 0.1. 1559 in year 3. For Ka band, the values once again changes significantly from minus 0.684 in year 1 to minus 0.8880 in year 3. 
The next column is Q-band, and the change is stunning. From negative 0.096 in year 1 to positive 0.0297 in year 3. The sign has completely changed and the absolute value of the coefficients differ by more than a factor of 3. Next we come to V-band. Now the value changed from 1.921 to 2.0446, a change of 6%. Finally we come to W-band. The value changes from minus 0.250 in year 1 to minus 0.3423 in year 3, a change of about 35%. These changes do not sound like a lot on the surface, but remember that cosmologists are looking for significance in tiny temperature fluctuations in the maps. Furthermore, they require stability on these images on a cosmological time frame. This cannot be achieved when the galactic microwave emissions and indeed the contributions of every other galaxy in the universe can vary substantially from year to year. If their result was stable on a cosmological timescale, an absolute requirement for doing cosmology, then the coefficients used to generate the one-year map and the three-year average should be absolutely identical for region zero, the very region in which they claim is pretty much free of galactic effects. Yet the coefficients are not stable, and this destroys once again all claims that these maps have anything to do with cosmology. In order to further illustrate that the year one data set does not agree with the three year data set, let us once again place the maps on top of each other and rapidly vary the opacity of the overlying map. You can immediately observe flickering throughout the image. This is occurring because pixels have different values in the two images. This becomes even more apparent when the scale is increased such that the details can be more easily visualized. It is also possible to compare the year one W map result with the three year average by simply subtracting the images. This is what you get in that case. Ideally, once again, the subtraction should lead to a black image, but in this case, it is clear that there is substantial residual throughout the map, as one can easily visualize, especially when the image is expanded. As a result, it is apparent that these two images are simply not the same, and this is despite the fact that the three year average contained year one. This brings us to another point. In order to ensure that these anisotropy maps have cosmological stability, one must be able to compare the maps on a year-to-year -year basis. Maps which are averaged over many years simply serve to mask temporal variations in the sky, variations which would make it very apparent that the results are unrelated to cosmology. Remember, that the cosmological timescale is on the order of thousands, millions, or billions of years. As such, anisotropy maps, which would have true cosmological value, must be stable on a pixel-to-pixel -pixel basis over the course of human existence. Just think of the consequences if only a few hundred pixels change from year to year on these maps. Over the course of a thousand years, then hundreds of thousands of pixels would be subject to change. Yet it is clear that when comparing the year one map to the three year average, hundreds of pixels are indeed significantly changing in value. This implies that over the course of a thousand years, an entirely different map would exist. This provides definitive proof that these maps have no value whatsoever as cosmological data. Well, that is all for now. If you enjoyed the video today, Promote the channel, mention the video to your local astronomy club, support me with a like and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below and I'll see you soon on our next video.